I think I first heard about the shroud in the early 80s. And um, I was mildly interested as a relic, but not being Catholic, I knew almost nothing about it. I, I do remember in the 90s uh, that I heard about carbon dating that had been dated to the 13th century. And I, I wasn't surprised. I was aware that many people regarded it to be authentic. Um, I was skeptical about it, mostly because of the date, uh, the carbon date. And then about 12 years ago, a, a respected mentor of mine said, hey, Ken, you need to look at this. And so I, I started investigating again. And I have to tell you what I discovered was shocking. Presentation. And um, I'm going to try my best to give you a brief overview of some, um, some of the things that I discovered on the subject that brought me to the place where I am right now regarding the shroud and the sedarium. So why don't we just jump in here. Uh, what we know. <clears throat> I just got a message here. One second. Okay. What we know about the shroud. Oh, and, and the sedarium. All four gospel accounts mention the burial of Jesus. And all four mention linen cloths or strips of linen. But John mentions two distinct cloths that he calls the linen strips and the head cloth that was lying separate from the linen strips. Here is the account as John records it. Then Simon Peter came along behind him, went straight into the tomb, and he saw the linen strips lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. So there's the two cloths. The cloth was still laying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. So we can learn a couple of things there. Um, the two cloths. I, here's an incidental thing, and I think it's just kind of funny, hilarious. I don't know whether John intended this, but he seems to want you to know that he can run faster than Peter. Because what he's doing, he's telling you the story about the moments after uh, the ladies have announced to the disciples the tomb is empty. So he and Peter go running. And he says in verse 6, Simon Peter came along behind him. And he's talking about himself in the third person. And he went straight into the tomb. It's like, huh, respect, dude. He runs right by him into the tomb. And so he sees the linen strips. And the cloth laying there. Finally, the other disciple, meaning himself, who had reached the tomb first, by the way, also went inside. He saw and believed. I don't know. I just thought it was very funny that John wants you to know he can run faster than Peter. But I digress. I'll go. Let's get back to the story. I noticed that a while back and I thought, this is hilarious. This is in the Bible. Okay. So to this day, the church is in possession of two separate cloths, which they claim are the linen strips and the head cloth mentioned in the Gospel of John. The linen strips are known as the Shroud of Turin, and the head cloth is known as the Sedarium of Oviedo. I don't know whether you've heard of that. It was, it was new to me. I, the first I heard of it was about 15 years ago. The Shroud is housed in a protective case and kept in the Cathedral of Turin in northern Italy, and the Sedarium is kept in the Camara Santa of the Cathedral of San Salvador in Oviedo, Spain. Um, let's talk about the head cloth a bit. Not a lot of people know much about it. The head cloth or Sedarium was placed over Jesus' head after he died, but while he was still on the cross. Some people wonder, where did that head cloth come from? Well, it was, it was done as a, a sign of respect for the dead, and no doubt, after um, the soldiers had been convinced that everyone on the cross was dead, there was some time uh, intervening and someone asked, could we please cover the faces? So a face cloth was placed on Jesus, possibly the other two. Now this cloth remained on his body until it was uh, removed when they carried the body to the tomb. So you can picture this, that cloth stays on for quite a period of time. 
And there's evidence actually that the body was laid face down for a period of about a half an hour. We can tell this from the, um, from the stains on it. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit more about it later. <clears throat> but once they get to the tomb, at this point, it's removed from his head and it's folded and set to the side. Now, you can see the shroud is a different sort of a thing. It, look at the picture on the right. It's a large and expensive piece of linen that was laid underneath Christ's body and then folded over the top, as you can see there. A, um, apparently, a strip was ripped off lengthwise and used to tighten it. And um, we can see that from looking at the shroud right here. And so here we get the first look at the shroud. And I want you to just have a look at that. <clears throat> the shroud is a, a linen cloth woven in a three over one herringbone pattern measuring 14, three by three foot seven. On the shroud is the precise photo negative image of a man front and back who has suffered wounds consistent with scourging and crucifixion. So that's remarkable. This is the first photo negative image ever, um, ever known to humans. There is visible fire damage from a fire in 1532. 14 um, large triangular patches and eight smaller ones can be seen. You see that all over there. We'll talk a bit about that a little more. A four inch strip can be seen reattached to the top portion of shroud. You see it up there. You see that fine line and the two uh, patches on the edges. We'll talk about that a bit more. <clears throat> so the first mention that we have of the shroud outside of the New Testament, the, uh, the first major mention of it is from uh, Athanasius in the fourth century. And he says, an image of our Lord and Savior at full length was taken from Jerusalem to Syria in the year 68. Here's the quote. Two years before the destruction of Jerusalem, all the Christians left it and betook themselves to the kingdom of Agrippa, at which time, among other things belonging to the church, this image also was carried away and ever since remained in Syria. I want you to notice a couple things there. The, uh, <clears throat> the Christians have left the city of Jerusalem by the year 68. And you may wonder, why did they do that? Well, um, Jesus warned them specifically in the Gospel of Luke. It's recorded. He said to them, the city and the temple will be destroyed. And when you see armies surrounding the city, get out of town. Go to the hills. You can read that quote. It's in Luke. So when they heard this warning, they took it very seriously. They all packed up and left. And you know what happened two years later. Titus uh, destroyed the city, the temple, and uh, killed many, many Jewish inhabitants. So the shroud was taken away to Syria. Now it's thought that the shroud remained in and around Antioch until the sixth century. The fourth century historian Eusebius wrote about the cloth bearing the image of Christ that was known as the image of Edessa. Maybe some of you heard of that. Well, the image of Edessa, many experts think that it actually was the shroud uh, simply folded so that only the face was visible. So this, the shroud has been stored in various ways over the years, but one of the ways they think in Syria was it was folded with just the face showing. Um, in 540, 554, it was reported that Orthodox priests began to show the image of Christ in the streets of Cilicia and Cappadocia. So this is a period of time now Christianity has become established. Christians are quite comfortable. They begin to do things more in public and the shroud comes out. It begins to be displayed and people are seeing it. Um, and, and they're coming from miles around. Just, just to give you an idea of the territory that we're talking about here. So you can see um, uh, 
on the map, we're going to zoom in on this little region, North Syria and uh, Southern Turkey. Here is uh, Antioch, Edessa, Cap um, Cilicia, Cappadocia. So this is a reason where this shroud spent uh, the first 600 years. Now, shortly after this report, a painting of the shroud image known as Christ Pantocrator, or ruler of all, shows up in the monastery of St. Catherine's in Egypt. Some of you might be familiar where, uh, about the monastery in, in St. Catherine's. It's in the Sinai Peninsula. And this painting um, is remarkable um, in that it, it's, it sets the standard from then on all images of Christ will look like this. Prior to this, you have all kinds of fanciful ideas about what Jesus looked like, your paintings, or, but after this, they become standardized. They all look like this. And um, analysis of this painting uh, shows more than 50 points of congruence between it and the shroud. And if you know anything about facial recognition software, that should impress you. There's an overlay of the shroud face on top of this painting. So you can see that it is um, remarkably similar. Obviously, the, the artist had the shroud in front of him. By 692, Emperor Justinian II began minting something called the gold solidus. And that was a, um, a coin that he used to pay his soldiers. It was a day's wages. And... Um, it has almost a perfect match. It has over a hundred points of uh, congruity with the shroud up to and including the fold in the fabric by the neck. So this coin um, is an amazing copy. And, and we have lots of these coins and they date back to the seventh century. And what I'm trying to do here um, I guess is trying to establish for you what's called a chain of custody of evidence. When, um, like if you're building a case um, for something, if you're um, like a, on a legal team, you're building a case, you submit something into evidence. Anytime that evidence is touched, it's reported, there's a chain of custody so that you know uh, where the article has been how long it's been there, who's handled it, that sort of thing. So what we're seeing here is a, a historic chain of custody for this relic. So the shroud was then moved to Constantinople um, in 944. So it was in this region for just about a thousand years. And you can read about this. Um, the, the Archdeacon of Constantinople had a big sermon celebrating this event. And it comes to Constantinople with, with much fanfare. And after that, pilgrims report that it can be seen every Friday at the Church of Blachernane. If you, um, if you just search for this, you can see that there, uh, we have recorded eyewitness accounts of people who sit in services in this church. And every Friday, there's a solemn ceremony, they report, at the end of which um, the shroud is lifted up and it's backlit by candlelight. And if you can imagine the shroud being a um, photo negative image, that'd be quite powerful if you backlit it. And many, many pilgrims report that this was just the, um, the most amazing pilgrimage that they did to see this. And it remained in Constantinople for almost 300 years until the city was sacked. And of course, after that, it disappears because uh, this region is thrown into confusion and the shroud appears um, 150 years later in France, in Lyry. Came into the possession of a French knight, Geoffrey de Charny, and he was an enterprising fellow. He, he began putting it on display for pilgrims and it turned into a, a bit of a... a tourist business for him, where he would have people from all over Europe coming, looking at the shroud, then they would go to his gift shop, whatever, have a coffee and uh, buy a souvenir. And he had a whole bunch of these little medallions made. And you can see that these are 
um, remarkable likenesses to the shroud. So if you were a, um, a wealthy person and you were able to travel and do a pilgrimage, you might go see the shroud in France, buy a souvenir on the way. Not that different from what we do these days, right? In 1532, there was a fire in the chapel of Chambury where it was stored and um, part of the metal storage case melted and fell on the cloth, leaving burns. So you can imagine a decorative case with silver corners and these corners get hot and they melt and they pour into this container and the shroud begins to burn and efforts to extinguish the fire uh, left water stains. And I can just imagine the anxiety level of these guys who are trying to put the fire out. They're going, oh, we've had this thing for 1500 years and now it's burnt. But miraculously, they pull it out of the box and the image is mostly untouched. So they regarded that as a miracle. A couple of years later in 1534, a group of nuns did some significant repair work on the shroud as, as well as attaching a support cloth to the back. It became known as the Holland support cloth. And uh, the four inch strip, that's the time that the four inch strip that was separate was reattached and sewn back onto the top. And the shroud was at that point moved to Turin, 1578, where it remains to this day. That's remarkable. It's been sitting in Turin now for 450 years. That is a long time. Then on like 300 years, not a lot, not a lot of news to report. But in 1898, Secundo Pia photographed the shroud for the first time and his pictures shocked the world. And of course they would because we were just learning about certain things like photography and um, the, it was the first time we had discovered things like photo negative and photo positive and uh, as Pia Secundo was developing the plates in his dark room he noticed that what he was getting was a positive image and it's reported that when he saw the face of Christ that he cried out my Lord and my God, it was deeply moving for him. It was a profoundly um, important event in his life to do this. And it, it had a huge impact. I mean, when people all over the world saw this, they were like, uh, the shroud was, was back as an article of conversation. Um, fast forward 80 years. In 1978, a team of researchers were allowed to examine the shroud in detail. Maybe you've heard about this, the STIRP Research Group, Shroud of Turin Research Project. There was a team of scientists. They brought all kinds of equipment. You can uh, find their story on the web. All of these things that I'm telling you are, are, um, are available to be researched. Nothing uh, controversial. Um, in 1981, they issued their final report. So the Vatican gave them access to the shroud, I think, for five days. So they had um, like 120 hours or something. And, and they worked 24-7 um, under the close supervision of Vatican officials. Here's what they said. We can conclude for now that the shroud image is that of a real human form of a scourged, crucified man. It is not the product of an artist. And that was profound because many people were certain that this was um, just some sort of a forgery, some sort of a, an artist. Some people thought, oh, Leonardo da Vinci did it. There's all kinds of ideas people had. <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, let's talk about the actual image that's on the shroud. It is a precise photo negative on a non-photographic medium, right there. That is remarkable. That's remarkable for a modern image, let alone 
an ancient image from antiquity. There is no paint, dye, vapors, scorching, etc. So it is definitely not been tampered with in that way. The image is restricted to the uppermost uh, part of the fibril. So when you analyze these uh, linen fibers under the microscope, this image just sits lightly on top. It's not soaked in, it's just very faintly on top. And um, when, when people report viewing the shroud, they say that if you walk too close to it, like if you get within 10 feet of it, you can't see anything. You have to back up, you have to see it from about 15 to 20 feet, and then you can resolve the image. It's that faint. <clears throat> so um, another thing, there's, there's blood on the shroud, right? And the blood imprints precede the formation of the image. Now, forensically, that's an important piece of information. If the shroud is authentic, of course, that has to be the case. There is also pollen on the shroud, and it's consistent with the plants native to Israel. So you have um, probably about 20 different um, pollen varieties on the shroud. But um, specifically, people wonder about this one. Pollen from the crown of thorns plant is, is actually concentrated near the head, which is what you'd expect if this was an authentic piece. Shadows of these other plants can be seen on the, on the image of the back. And what do I mean by shadows? Well, it's, it appears that before they laid the body of Christ on the shroud, a, uh, a bouquet of flowers was thrown down because <clears throat> um, you can see the shadow of these flowers when you look at the image on the back of the shroud. You can see their outline. So obviously the plants themselves didn't leave an image. Of course, that makes sense, but their shadows are there. Here's something that I found absolutely stunning. Roman coins were found over the eyes and they were able to resolve these coins and they found out that they were minted by Pontius Pilate in 29 AD. Turns out they were the famous widow's mite coin. <clears throat> here's, here's another thing that's remarkable, 3D imaging on the shroud reveals both flesh and bones. It's like an x-ray. If, you, uh, if you're interested in this, you can go online and see how they use these VP8 image analyzers. And they can, uh, they just go in, in depths on the shroud and it is, is like doing an MRI. It's like you get cross sections. You go from the beard to the skin, to the teeth, to the bones. It's, uh, um, it's shocking. Plus when, plus when they look at it from certain angles, they get a 3D impression. You can, you can research this stuff for yourself if you're interested. I'm not going to go into detail about it here, only to say that it has um, unique properties. This image is um, unique on every level. But wasn't there a carbon-14 test that debunked it? Yes, there was. Okay, in 1988, a team of scientists announced the research, uh, the results from the C14 test they had done on samples from the shroud, and boom, there's the date they announced. 1260 to 1390 AD, and they had a great deal of confidence in their findings. Uh, they sent their, their uh, samples to three labs, and they got the same results from all three labs. So the matter was settled. And when I heard this, I, I probably heard it in the 90s. I, um, I was like, okay, well, that settles it. It is obviously something that was manufactured in the 13th century and we don't know how. And uh, kind of moved on. However, in 2000, a study by uh, a couple, Marino and Benford, opened the debate again. And I never heard about this until quite a bit later. And I don't think many people did 
it wasn't um, wasn't highly publicized. Their research found that the sample that had been dated came from a repaired section of the shroud. Well, that was big news. And that was a big allegation to make because uh, members of the STIRP team were still alive. And Ray Rogers in particular, who was in charge of the dating and the sampling, um, he had something to say about that. And he, when he heard this, he immediately set out to refute um, these claims. But to his surprise, when he examined the reserve samples, he actually found they were right. Cotton was woven in with the linen. And this was just very highly troubling to him. I mean, he was getting to be an old man. So here he is. He's got a new mission in life. He is back out of retirement. And he is on a mission to let people know about this. So he gets back to work. But unfortunately, he, be, he uh, fell ill with cancer shortly after this discovery. And um, it became the central focus of his life. It's all he did. He worked tirelessly, tirelessly over the next few years to overturn the false date that had hung over the shroud. It was, it was an all-consuming thing for him. It was something he had to do before he died. And very graciously, two months before his death, he submitted his findings to a peer-reviewed journal. And here's what he said, the new conclusion. The radiocarbon datings were accurate, but because the samples were taken from cloth that was not part of the original shroud, they are irrelevant to the age of the linen that bears the image. So there you have it. That's big news. That is something that did not get nearly the amount of coverage as the initial um, carbon dating did. This kind of went to the back page of the newspapers. Um, since that time, um, subsequent studies using other methods of dating have shown an age consistent with the, with the historical accounts. And it is very unlikely that there will be another carbon dating on the shroud because the Vatican is understandably reluctant to chop off little pieces every time somebody wants to do a date. So thankfully, there's other ways of, of telling the age of things. And um, people are comfortable now with a date in the first century. So just moving on here. There is no image like this in the world. This is a unique image. It's nothing like it at all. And it's not the product of an artist. And we currently are unable to re reproduce an image just like it. So let's talk about the Sidarium. Sidarium of Oviedo, maybe this is completely new to you, I don't know. Um, I, I only heard about this 10 years ago. Let's look at the history of the Sidarium. Sidarium is first mentioned in the Gospel of John, then Simon Peter came along behind him, went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen laying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, the cloth that was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. So we have two separate cloths. It measures 33 by 21 and does not have an image on it. And that makes sense too, right? There shouldn't be an image on it because it wasn't on the body at the time of the, cruci at the, time of the resurrection. It was removed the shroud was folded over and it was, the face cloth was set to the side. Now the blood type on the shroud and the sidarium are the same, AB positive. The wounds visible on the sidarium match the wounds of the man in the shroud and the facial structures Evident from the stains are consistent with the image on the shroud. And I'll just show you a picture here of the sidarium once again. So you're looking at it and you can tell that it was folded. It kind of looks like a Rorschach ink blot there. You see it was divided down the middle, laid onto his face, wrapped around and tied. And when we overlay this uh, little map 
you can see how they've identified all the different markings and um, you can watch videos if you're interested about how these things forensically link up to the face on the shroud. There, there are just tons of videos, very high quality research has been done into all of these things like the coins. You can watch an hour long video about the coins on the eyes. You can watch an hour about the flowers on the back. You, just every, every one of these things has just been researched to death. So let's look at the history, the chain of custody of the sedarium. It's uh, first mentioned in the New Testament. It's kept separate from the shroud uh, since the first century. The uh, sedarium is first mentioned outside the Bible in 570 AD by Antonius of uh, Piacenza. He writes, the sedarium was being cared for in the vicinity of Jerusalem in a cave near the monastery of St. Mark. So that is the first quote that we have referencing it. In, now in 614, it was moved to Alexandria ahead of the invasion of Persian King Khosrow II. Shortly after that, it was carried through Northern Africa, then on to Spain because the uh, King of Persia kept advancing. It entered Spain through Cartagena along with the people escaping the King of Persia. It then moved to Seville, then Toledo and on to Oviedo in Northern Spain to escape the Moors. And it has been there since 718 AD, more than 1300 years in one place. So um, remarkable, remarkable chain of custody history that we have with this relic. <clears throat> um, in conclusion, these two cloths are forensically linked and we're confident that they were in contact with the same body. Now, I'm gonna let you decide for yourselves as to the, significant, the significance of these two ancient cloths. But if you were to ask me, what's my take on it? I think the shroud is the real deal. Uh, the fact that these two cloths are still with us today is nothing short of a miracle. In fact, I would say that these cloths are more significant now than they've ever been. In, in what can only be described as a great act of grace, God has given this generation, <clears throat> this generation that likes to see pictures, the greatest selfie ever. And it was taken at the precise moment of the greatest event in the history of humankind. And graciously, he has preserved it for us to look at today. And he's also made sure that we have the technology to appreciate it. Oops, let's go back here. So with that, I will conclude this presentation and I just want you to focus uh, your gaze on the screen one last time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>